Bless these, Lord. They are very particular. They came, they came from everywhere to this place. They, lay, they laid aside the duties laid upon their hearts in order to come here. And, and they're hearing. They're hearing. And they're changing. They're changing. And, and, and we believe you, Lord, that these can be the greatest days in the history of the human race. So bless these in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. It's so good to see you. Turn to the one right by you and say, My, you look so pretty. <laughs> we, we got the prettiest people in the world here. Hi. The prettiest people in the world. I was born into Pentecost when I came into the world. My mother had already received the Holy Ghost. They spoke in tongues so much in my house, I didn't know which one you're supposed to use out in the yard, the tongues or the English. <laughs> so I'm not new to the, to the Pentecost. My father was a hard shell Baptist. A hard shell Baptist is a fellow that cusses and smokes, commits adultery, and a few other things. But on Sunday, he goes to church, puts on a clean shirt goes to church and sings Amazing Grace. And all the angels up there fold their wings and say, it's amazing. <laughs> my mother was a Methodist and she received the Holy Ghost and changed our home. And out of seven children, she got four preachers. And finally, she got my daddy too. He was the last one that came in. When I was 16 years old, I began to spit blood. Being a smart lick, I'd tell the boys that uh, that's tobacco juice. But it wasn't, it was my lungs. At the end of my 16th year, I hit the bed and stayed there for five months, dying. It's, 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 it's very difficult to die when you're just 17. Very difficult. You get angry. My mother would bring those old prayer meeting women in to pray. I hate old prayer women, you know. <laughs> they wear their dresses up to there and down to there and down to yon, and you say, what you hiding, you know? <laughs> Can't see much. But a 17-year-old has funny ideas. <laughs> They'd go to pray and I'd stick my head under the cover and cuss them. I would have cussed them on the outside, but my mother would have whipped me with a razor strap for that, so I just cussed them down under the cover. And they'd say, why does this innocent little child have to suffer? And I wasn't a child and I wasn't innocent. I was full of the devil. Slowly, there in Panama City, I was dying, and our doctor only lived three doors away in those days, family doctors. They had no magic medicine in those days. They, you just died. My room that I slept in was made out of 24 windows. All I had was sunshine and fresh air and was dying. And one night, a run afternoon, about 4 o'clock, I began to choke and spit up blood and turn purple. Our doctor ran over to me, and he tried to take a pulse. He tried to get a drop of blood. He tried everything he knew to try. And he turned to my parents, and he said, that boy is dying. He says, in two hours, he'll be dead. He says, I have a little work at the office. He says, I'll go down and make out the death report and also the certificate of his death. And you take it to the cemetery and you can get a lot to bury him in. And he walked out the door. Nor normally doctors, you know, pretty clever people and, and they know what they're talking about. But uh, he, he, he's just about 500,000 hours off now. He said, I'd be dead in two hours and I've been going for the last 500,000 hours. But he's been dead for two or 300,000 himself. You have to be careful of your pronouncements. You might be the one that have them. Anyway, that very night I looked and I saw on one side of my bed a casket. I've only had two visions in my life, and it's so beautiful. You know, you know, a casket is a pretty thing if it's for your mother-in-law. But <laughs> if it's for you, you know, it's a, it don't matter how pretty it is, you don't like it. And I looked at that thing and I just hated it. God said, that's yours. And I turned my head the other way, and there was a wall and a Bible against it, open. The Bible was standing up. God said, if you're a preacher, I'd let you live. I said, I don't like preachers. My daddy taught me not to like preachers. And I'm just like my daddy. God said, well, go ahead and die. I looked over, and the casket was still there. So I turned my head back the other way, and the Bible was still there. That's what you call being between a rock and a hard place. I didn't want either one of them. I didn't want to preach. I didn't even want to get saved, much less preach. I, 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 I didn't want to die. 
And so between the two, I, I finally said, Lord, if you just, if you just let me live, th then I'll preach, you know. And that was the first time in my life that I knew down deep inside that I was telling the truth because I was a habitual liar. But I knew that if I said yes, it was yes forever. And so I said, and furthermore, Lord, if you'll let me live as long as I preach, I'll soon be the oldest man in the world. You know, you can't help being Irish if you're born that way. <laughs> I woke up the next morning, and, and, uh, and, and uh, I had no fever for the first time in six months. And it, it was gone. I had no pain in my chest. And, and where I drew blood every night off on my pillow from out of my mouth, uh, there was no blood there. And uh, I felt good. I was hungry. And, and uh, my mother, you know, precious little mother, she was swarming right close by. And uh, I looked up and I said, I'm hungry. She says, I'll get you some grape juice. And I said, I've had all the grape juice I want for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's what they give you when you don't know what else to give you. They'd, they'd fed me liquids for the number of weeks I hadn't had any solid food. I said, I'm hungry. She said, what do you want? I said, you know, regular breakfast like my dad has. You know, 17-year-olds always want what their dad's got. And, 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 you know, down south when I was a boy, we didn't smile at the breakfast table. We used it. Hot biscuits made in the kitchen. Uh, ham that you can't read the newspaper through. Grits. How many have had grits? That's soul food, you know. And, and soul food, gravy that's thick and white and has a lot of good things in it, including pepper. And that's P for power. And so uh, I said... I want just what my daddy had. She said, you, you, you can't do that. And then she thought, well, every dying person, she said, I, I was already over, over time for dying about 12 hours here. And, and she said, every dying person has a last request. She says, I'm going to give him his last request. He'll be dead in a few minutes. So she went out and prepared it, but she didn't give it to me. She set it by the side of the bed and went out to cry. You know, there's nobody in the world like mothers. They can cry when you do and cry when you don't, you know. They can cry when you're a sinner and cry when you get saved. They can cry when you don't preach and cry when you do. You just, you know, they just got different faucets, you know. They just, <laughs> nobody else has them but them. And so she went out to cry, and I grabbed that plate. And, 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 and when she got back about 10 minutes later, <laughs> it looked as if a cat had walked through, and it was all gone. It was clean. She said, where's that food? And, and, and I said, uh, uh, right down there. And I said, I want some more. I'm hungry. She says, said, no, 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 no. If the doctor knew I gave you that, I don't know what he'd do to us. So she so, says, so, well, I said, don't mess with the doctor. I said, let me tell you something. I'm going to preach. Then she knew I was going to die. She, <laughs> of the seven kids, I was the worst. And so she, she knew it was all over then. And so she went back to cry some more. In three days, I walked all over our house. And in 10 days, I went out fishing. All day long on the Gulf of Mexico, came back with a boat loaded. Uh, three weeks later, the Lord said, did you tell me you were going to preach? I said, well, yeah. Well, he says, get to it. Well, he said, now. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. So 17-year-olds always ask their daddy what to do, even though he's full of the devil. So my father was eating breakfast. And I, I walked into the kitchen. He ate in the kitchen just before going to work. He ate before the rest of the family got around. And I said, Papa, we called our daddy Papa 60 years ago. And I said, Papa, I'm going to preach. You, you would have thought I'd have thrown a gallon of ketchup on him. He was a full-blood Irishman. His blood pressure began to rise, and I thought he was going to explode. There was just the two of us in there, and he weighed about 250 pounds was an enormous man, been a machinist ever since he was a teenager, tremendous muscles, and, and he was just puffing up. And then he hit the table with both fists, and his coffee cup came in the air. And he said, well, I'll be damned. <laughs> and he began to cuss me. He said, you're going to starve to death. Well, I didn't know but what they had a graveyard for preachers that starved. I hadn't investigated you know I knew some of them did disappear and didn't come back but I didn't know where they were you know but you always believe your daddy when you're 17 and he got real angry now when he liked me he called me Lester but when he didn't he'd say boy 
and you could just feel your toenails curl up a little, you know. And he said, boy, I'm going to work, and I'll finish this tonight. I said, oh, God, there won't be anything to finish, you know. I went up to my bedroom, and I, I, I fell on the floor on my belly, and I hurt like a little kid can never hurt. I was just trembling all inside. And suddenly God just spoke and said, read Isaiah 41 and 10. I didn't know what it was anymore. Maybe some of you would know. I just, I just grabbed, grabbed a Bible to see what he said. It said, fear thou not. And it seemed as if a hand went down my throat and pulled out something like an old turnip with long tendrils and fear was gone. And it hadn't been back yet. It made me a new man. Yeah. I said, fear thou not. I wasn't afraid of my daddy. I wasn't afraid of anybody. It was gone. I said, well, he may have something else. I better go back. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I said, hey, my papa's not going to go. He made that very evident. Hey, you're going to be with me? Fear thou not. I be not dismayed. Well, he said I was going to starve. So I guess, I guess, I guess I don't need to be dismayed. He said, for I am thy God. Oh, I said, Moses, God, uh, 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 yeah, Moses, God, Elijah's God. I said, yeah, yeah, that's, well, I says, I take it. If, if you be with me like you were with Moses, well, I'll take that. I got up off the floor, dressed, put all my earthly belongings in a little case about this long. Uh, they're fiberboard cases. You people that are over 50 have seen them. You bought them at Woolworths for 19 cents. They're $4.98 now, but they're not as good as the originals, you know. They were pretty steady. And I found that little case in the closet, and I put all my earthly belongings in it, and had a lot of room left over, and I walked downstairs. Now, these little Christian mothers, they're darlings. They're always there. Before I could get down the steps, there she was. Where are you going? Out to preach. Out to what? To preach. You're going to preach? Well, I told you I was going to preach. Oh. And then she cried some more. She says, where am I going to write to? I says, I don't know where I'm going. She says, you're, you're going to go with not knowing. I said, where you go is not important. Going is important. Well, she couldn't understand that either. So I kissed her goodbye and walked out on the sidewalk there on the, on the front porch. And, and the kid that took me fishing, about two years older than I, he said, hi, Lester, where are you going? And I said, out to preach. He says, really? They knew how mean I was a few days before, you know. Really? I said, yeah, God's called me to preach. He said, can I go too? Well, I said, well, what could you do? Well, he said, don't you need some song singing? Oh, I said, yeah, sure. I said, can you sing? He said, no. <laughs> and he could have said to me, can you preach? And I'd have said, no. <laughs> Two no-nos, you know. He said, my jalopy runs. And I said, right. You know, about 60 years ago, every boy had a jalopy. I think the engine was an old Overland. They went bankrupt for obvious reasons. And uh, <laughs> had four tires, no fenders, no top. You don't want a top, you jump in. You see, and we got in that thing, and it'd say chug, 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 chug. You know, you go three forward and two back. <laughs> you had to be young to endure it. And I found out about five miles up the road that, that you had to have more water than gas. You didn't need much gas, but man, if you didn't have water, you were in trouble. It blew up. So I grabbed the big jug, went out and cooled it down, ran over to the farmer and got some more and put it back there for reserve. About five miles more, it blew up again. And then when it blew up, hot water came on you. And, and so uh, we did that about three times and parked by the side of the road uh, right under a persimmon tree. And I had my first meal away from home. Persimmons. We must have eaten a hundred of them. Thank God they were ripe. <laughs> then we chugged about two more times, and out in the middle of a field, I saw a little white building, schoolhouse. I says, I'll take it. And so we stopped a man, said, who's got the key? And they said, oh, over the hill, over yonder on the other side, you'll find him. So I jumped the fence, ran across the field, over the hill, found an old man. I said, give me the key to the schoolhouse. I got to preach there. Now, that's not a way a 17-year-old talks to a 50-year-old, you know? But he turned around, and I laughed out loud. He, he had a, a straw hat on that looked as if a horse had taken a bite out of the side of it. Had a big gap there in it. He pushed it up, and he was bald-headed. He didn't have any teeth. 
But he had a cooter tobacco in this cheek and a cooter tobacco in that cheek. And he was groovy. It was running down both sides and falling off of his cheek. Now, I had never seen anything like it. And I said, <laughs> I said, give me that key. He was just about to say no, and I said, oh, you can't say that. I said, I was dying of tuberculosis down in Panama City, and, and, and God said that I could live on one condition that I preach, and if you don't give me the key, I'll die, and you're to blame for it anyway. <laughs> now, that'll get a key out of a farmer. I don't know about a, about a city boy, but a farmer will give over a key. He gave me a long, greasy string with a key on the end of it. I said, I need a lantern, too. So he gave me a lantern. And I went over to his house and picked up the land and went over and swept out the little old schoolhouse with my friend. And that night, eight farmers came to church, not one woman. Now, I don't know who got them all notified about it. I didn't notify anybody except the one man, eight of them. They came down and sat in those homemade seats. This was during the Depression. And they didn't stop like you did. They just kept on going till all you could see was a nose and a bald head. I, I told my friend, I says, I, the meeting's all yours. And you'd give a lot of money to sing the first 10 minutes. He couldn't sing and they wouldn't. <laughs> now it was something else. He came back and sat down and he said, this meeting's yours. <laughs> so I got up and looked at those eight guys and I hated every one of them. And I didn't know what to do. I said, I know what I'll do. I said, I'll tell my life story. There's nothing so interesting as a life story of a 17 year old. He knows it all, and he's been everywhere, you see? And so I proceeded to tell my life story. And those farmers hadn't heard anything like it lately, and they would hit the desk and spit tobacco juice. I don't know which one was the champion, but they could spit a circle that big and hit the wall with it, poop, and it would run down the wall. And that made me mad, too. So they would spit tobacco juice while I talked. I told them that this is the story of my life, just as it was. I was very simple with it. When I got through, I was upset at him. I says, you can go. And under my breath, I says, and I hope you go to hell, every one of you. <laughs> you see, I didn't belong to the church of God. I hadn't gotten sanctified. <laughs> In my denomination, they didn't teach that. But anyway, they went and I went. And the next day I told my friend, I said, there won't be anybody out tomorrow night. We didn't announce any more meeting. I said, let's just look around the farm. I said, I think we'll go back home. After, after We give one chance tomorrow night. So we, we looked around the farm all day, and that night there were 30 people out there. I said, where did these people come from? I didn't invite anybody. The farmers that go around told the other farmers, he said, the biggest liar that ever came through here is over to the schoolhouse. <laughs> So they had come to hear a liar, and I didn't know it at the time. Eight or ten of them was women, and, and you know, country women can sing real good. And so my, my, my boyfriend, a couple of years older than I, he got up and he didn't do it in time, but he, the women did the singing. They could sing Amazing Grace, you see, and he waved his arms a little bit, and the song service must have lasted ten minutes, you know, maybe twelve. And he sat down, and he said, it's all yours. And I said, now, what do you do the second time? I said, I hadn't prepared anything. I said, I know what I'll do. I'll tell my life story. <laughs> you can always go back on your life story, you know. I said, I'll tell my life story. And that was the thing to do because they had gone out and told all these people what a liar I was. And so I had to tell the people what they had told them I'd said. So I told the life story over again. And right in the middle of my talk, They'd stand up and spit tobacco juice out of toe, just what he said. And I didn't know what they were talking about. But by the time I got through, I was so mad, I said, go on home. And under my breath, and I says, I hope you go to hell. I was an angry young man. The next morning, the man we were staying with says, how long are you going to stay here? And I said, I don't know. I thought I'd get to leave today, but too many came out last night. He says... How long did these things last? I said, how do I know? This is the first one. <laughs> well, he says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Well, I says, I'm going to work. I'm going to preach. He said, that ain't work. Well, I said, what is work? He said, feeding my hogs is work. Now, I, I said, I've seen ham on the table, but 
not in the rear. <laughs> and hadn't been out in the country. I was born in New Orleans, lived in Mobile in Panama City, but I said, I don't know anything about hogs except on the table. But he says, I'm going to show you. He says, these are slop. And I almost vomited. Slop cans. I said, oh, give them another name. <laughs> and I picked up two big old five-gallon cans. And he said, go down there and you'll find them at the end of that path. And I went down there with that slop all over the side of my pants. I only had two pair of pants in the world, one off and one on. And now one of them had slop on it. I got down there and found those pigs up to their knees in their own filth. And I said, if this ever gets around, everybody will stop eating bacon. <laughs> and I found out what a hog is. I poured the slop in there and they jumped in with their feet and begin to knock each other out of the way and gallop it down a little too fast. That's what a hog is. Eats with his feet. And so uh, I was so weary, I didn't know what to do. I went and laid down in the corn patch and began to cry like a little baby. And I said, God, I just wish I'd have taken the coffin. I made a mistake. He says, if you don't mind, you can just go back to that moment and I'll take it. I just don't want to do this. I said, I've always been a prodigal. They told me that one day I'd die on a gallows somewhere. I was so mean. And, and I said, here I am up in the hog pen, just like that guy in the Bible. I'm in the hog pen. And I said, I want to die. And God said, real strong. He said, if you'd be faithful, I'll bless you. I said, really? I didn't believe it, you see. I said, what do you mean? He said, beyond anything that you could ever imagine. Because you have no ability to imagine how oh, I'm going to bless you. I said, I'm going to have to feed hogs. He said, no, this is the only time you'll have to feed hogs. I says, I'll take it. So I, I got up and went back to the house and out in the country like that, way out in the middle of the yard was an old well, got me a bucket of water and got a pan, wash, changed my pants and washed my pants, put an old flat iron on an old wood stove and got it warm and, and pressed my pants. Then I decided I better get something other to talk about. I couldn't tell my life story for the rest of my life. And so I said, well, I'll tell you a good one, the prodigal, because I'm feeding hogs. And so I found that in the Bible, and that was one night. And I said, another good one would be Daniel in the lion's den. That's where I am, too. I feel like I'm being eaten up. And I, I said, another one would be the three children in the fire furnace. I said, it sure is hot messing around with these farmers here. So I went to, back to my Sunday school days, and we preached about a week. And I said, where does the money come in on this thing? I said, I, I remember going to church, but says I was talking to the girls so much on the back seat until I don't know what they did, really. But they did something about money, I know. Uh, maybe on Sunday morning they did something about money. But I said, we've lost something here. I've been here a week and nobody's mentioned money. My father is right. Maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die now. So I said, we're going to take up an offering. Anybody got a hat? You know, back in those days, how many ever heard of pass the hat? Well, that's what we did. We passed the hat. I said, somebody loaned me a hat. One of the farmers loaned me his hat. We passed it around. And they had made a little altar down in front there. And, and uh, so I, I dumped all the money on the altar and gave the man his hat back. And then a 17-year-old would do anything, you know. I counted it in front of everybody. One, <laughs> two, three. There were 26 pennies. No nickels, no dimes. I looked up. And, you know, a 17-year-old is really interesting. I said, I can't live on that. I couldn't live on 26 cents. And all the farmers ducked their heads. It was during the Depression, man. A penny was worth something those days. You could even buy something with a penny. And I just got mad. I said, anybody here got any chickens? Every hand went up. I said, I have some coops out there tomorrow night, and I don't mean maybe fill them up. I said, anybody got any pigs? Every hand went up. I said, I have a coop over there for pigs tomorrow night. Fill it up. They laughed. You know, farmers are the most beautiful people in the world. They laughed and they laughed. And the next night, you couldn't hardly have church. We had so many chickens out there cackling. We had so many pigs out there grunting and groaning until you couldn't hardly have church. I told a man there, I said, go sell them and bring me the money. And I was the richest preacher in the country right off. You know, just because you're young, you don't have to be dumb, you know. With a, within a year, I bought me a brand new Ford. So... I don't have any bad stories to tell. I just take up offerings. And I hadn't got out of it yet, you know. I, just, I went on from school. We, we stayed in that place 
until they built their own church building. Two missionaries went to Africa, and one was a great pastor in this country. And so then we went on to another little schoolhouse, another little schoolhouse. And, and that went on for, for 18 months, and I had my second vision. And I saw the whole world go to hell with my own eyes. Don't tell me there's not a hell. I saw it. I saw the whole world go to hell. I, 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 hell looks like a volcano at night. I, it, it's, it's, it's yellowish gold. And, and it, it, it rolls in like waves. And, and I saw all the nations of the world on the highway of life, and I saw them go to hell. And God said, you're to blame for it. And I said, I'm not to blame. I don't know them. I don't know those Japanese and Chinese and Manchurians and Mongolians and India. I don't know those people. God said, you're to blame for it. And he quoted to me from, Gen uh, from uh, uh, huh? he, he quoted to me from uh, Ezekiel 3, 17, 18, 19. And, and said that if the ungodly commits his ungodly deeds and you don't warn him of his ungodliness, I require your blood at his hands. And I saw blood run between all my fingers. And I said, what, what do you mean? He said, you've got to go and preach to those people. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm ready to go back to Florida. I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to do that. No, for goodness sake, I don't even want to preach, much less go to those people. He says, that's what you have to go on. Their blood is required at your hands. I can't tell you that whole story, but it turned my whole world around. When I was 20 years old, I was on a boat in San Francisco and went to find the world. Found Brother Howard Carter over in, the, over in, in Australia, and we went together through many, many nations of the world, over a hundred nations. God showed me so many things in those nations as we live with the people. We talk here about black and white, you know, and I, I can't quite understand what they're talking about. I've just lived with them all my life, you see. I've, I've, I've lived with the third world people since I was 20 years old, and so to, I don't see any difference, you know. The, some of the greatest friends I've ever had in my life were, were, were Chinese and, and, and Filipinos and, 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 and Africans. I mean, I never had people so close to me as, as they were. So uh, to me, it's, it's so natural. You know, your skin about one sixteenth of an inch thick, but on the inside of there's blood. And you once get inside that skin, you got the real person. The life of the flesh is not in the skin. It's in the blood. You see, it's in the blood. And, and, and so... Uh, if you never get past that skin business, you got the real thing. Because if one of these black brothers here were sick, my blood could save him. And, and if I'm sick unto death, his blood could save me. Our blood's the same, you see. And, and, and so we're, we're blood brothers. And we thank God. We thank God that with God, all the nations of the world are the same. And in heaven, we're all going to look alike. Look alike. And, and, and in heaven, we're all going to be like Jesus. How many glad we're going to be like Jesus? Yeah. We did missionary work for many years, and I was pastoring in Manila, and God said to me, I want you to go home to America. I said, I don't want to do that. I want to live out here. I like this out here. He said, I want you to go home to America and stay there. And I said, oh, I don't, don't want to do that. He said, America's in worse shape than this country here, and you've got to go help save America. I said, I couldn't do anything like that. He said, I'm going to give you a million souls by television. I said, I don't want to do that either. He said, if you'll go home, I'll make you a blessing to the young ministers of the whole nation. Well, I said, uh, I'm, I'm doing something wrong. We, 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 we had one of the largest churches in the Orient, and I, I didn't want to leave it. And he said, you've got to go home. We came home and didn't own a folding chair. Some of my best friends said that you're 50 and you're finished. And I said, God, is that true? And he said, no, you haven't got started yet, really. Well, I said, I'd like to get started if you don't mind. <laughs> and I wrote a book, Run With a Vision. And I began to run hard with that vision. And he told me seven things that were going to happen in America. And they're happening right now. He told me all about the, the homosexual thing. And I could see it half-dressed with leather around them, brazenly going down the street, boasting of their homosexuals. I saw it before, before I came back to this country. But he also showed me that the greatest revival humanity has ever had would burst upon the scene and knock to pieces all that junk. Just knock it to pieces. <laughs> he 
He's given us television station after television station. We are on two networks besides our own, and we're in 13 and 1400 towns and cities across America every day, teaching, teaching the word of the Lord. So he, he, is, he is bringing that to pass. But he also told me at that time that there are three great things that would, that, that would, uh, that would bring the climax of this great revival. You see, love and unity through signs and wonders. He said, in the last great revival, we must believe alike. You know, you, you can't go in with strange doctrines. Billy Graham and I talked together for about two hours when, when he was in, in, uh, in, in, in Indianapolis and his crusade there. And he said, Lester, I'm determined that when I die, I'm going to be preaching the same thing I did when I started. He said, I'm not going to try to get deep, profound. He says, I'm going to teach just like I did. He said, the same sermons, I'm going to preach them when I die as when I started. You know, two hours in his presence will do something for you. It's, I never met a humbler man in my life than that man is, you see. You know, the devil would like for all of us to, to, to believe a lot of kooky stuff, you know, that don't mean anything in the world. He wants us to be united in truth. He wants us to, you know, to love God and have truth orbited, you know, clear all the way around. I appreciate Oral. Preach us the same sermons he did 30 years ago, you see. Same message. He has, he has the same message now. Somebody says, oh, he's too simple. No, don't tell the sinners that. That's all they understand. <laughs> They don't understand anything else. And that's who we want. We want the sinners, you see. So, first to have tremendous unity, we, got, we, we just got to have a, a unity in God, in the truth. Now, in my 57 years in the ministry, I can't help looking 39. I was born that way. <laughs> and I didn't like I'm 29. I can't help that either. But we've got to be unified in truth. Happy and I got to preach the same truths. We, he could lead me to his church, you know. And he's going away somewhere and comes back. It'll be all right. I've taught the same thing that he, that he teaches. We're one in truth, you know. And he said the second element that would bind this great unity together is that we truly love one another. And that's been talked about in all these sessions, every one of them, you see. You've got to stop downgrading one another. You know, we have these four television stations on the air. We, we have shortwave all over the world. And the mass media moved in on me wickedly. Saying, you've got to tell us what you think. You've got to... I said, wait a minute. I don't have to do anything. Do as I please. I said, i got a word for you from God. He told me to keep my lips shut and my heart open. And I'm praying for those people. They said, well, we can't put that on the air. And I said, I didn't think you could. It's better to pray for people. These men, they're God's servants. They're not yours. Amen. None of your business what Brother Will Roberts does. He's God's servant. You're no boss. Stop chewing around on God's servants. They're God's servants. Say God's servants. God's servants. That's not, they're not yours. A lot of people today are chewing on this one. Chewing, I like this and I don't like that one. You don't like or dislike. They're not yours at all. They're actually men from outer space <laughs> that receive the holy anointing from heaven. And they've got a message from God for you. It'll change your life. But leave them alone. We've got to love one another. We've got to care for one another. We've got to speak peaceably about one another. We, we haven't made it yet. But when we do, on, on the day of Pentecost, you know, they were all there. Doubting Thomas was there. Thank God he made it. <laughs> Blaspheming Peter was there. Big Shot John was there, wanting a throne a few days before. But they all, they all got there and began to love each other. And that's when the Holy Ghost fell. Yeah, the mightiest revival the earth has ever known is coming. But James, we've got to love one another. I love you. I watch you every day, you know. I know more about your grin than you do. I said, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I said, Hollywood would like to have him, and God got him first. Yeah, yeah. His, his disposition and all, just beautiful, just beautiful. God loves all of his children. We got to love all of God's children. And, and stop talking about them. Stop talking against them. It's none of your business. You see, I gave to this man. Oh, you didn't. You should have given to Jesus. Yeah.
And it's Jesus that's going to make it all right for us. The, the first great power of unity, a cable that holds us together, is truth. If I was going to come here and lecture, uh, Brother Ken, on, on I know there's no devil, you wouldn't want to come. You'd say, whoo, I can do something better than that. I'd play a game of golf then. But because you know that I'm going to come and say something that relates to your heart, you say, I'd like to go, you know. We will, we will cling together when we speak the same words together. We will cling together when we really care for one another. That we bow down to the floor. My, my sons are here, two of them. They'll tell you that when, when I got home from the Orient, the first thing I did, I called my sons together in, a, in our prayer room there in the, in the TV station. And we knelt down and I prayed for all these men. Now, they, they'll tell you that. That's the first thing I did. I, we knelt down together and we prayed for all these men. They're brothers, you see. And, and so we, we, we prayed for them. But that was preached here this morning. Some of the greatest preaching I've ever heard in my life was in this place this morning. You're the luckiest bunch of people in America and don't know it. You're here. Yeah. You're here. The, the, the third great string that holds us together is morals. God's had a problem with that from the beginning, evidently. And the devil would like to destroy the church through immoralities. If you knew that I was not a moral person, you wouldn't want to hear me talk. You just wouldn't want to hear me talk. But if you know that I have lived right and clean for all these years, you see, I'd like to hear him. It, it, it is so necessary for us to be a pure people. Now, 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 having lived so long, you know, several generations, you, you, you know so many things, you know. You just live so long, you know so many things. Some of that stuff you have to forget too. But I have never in my life met a, pe a preacher that intended to fall morally. Never met one in my, my whole life. The devil snares him into it. The devil snares him into it. If you shun the appearance of evil, you don't ever meet evil at all. You just shun the appearance of it. And if God would help our especially our pastors and our laity too, just to live a good, clean, pure, holy, consecrated life. It's amazing the mark it would make on the world that we live in today. If there's anything that'll break your unity from this brother's unity is for him to commit adultery. And you suddenly say, I don't think I want to go see him anymore. You, you just, he put something there. Our cleaving together has to do with our insides being clean, with our loving each other being pure, and our loving God being pure. It is so simple, really. And then when we do, we're going to have love, we're going to have unity, and we're going to have signs and wonders. And we're going to have signs and wonders. I prophesy that the greatest revival the earth has ever known is in the offing right now. And as some were saying this morning, it's already falling in certain parts. And we sure don't want to miss it. <laughs> we don't want Africa to get it all. And we don't want South Korea to get it all. We want our share of it. And by the grace of God, we're going to get our share of it. God has told me that by television and a 30-second prayer, I shall cast the devil out of 10,000 people, and they'll be wallowing all over their front rooms two or 3,000 miles away and come up from there clean by the power of God. Hallelujah! Glory to God!